Hey everyone, and welcome back to my completionist playthrough of the Baldur's Gate Saga with SCS and Ascension. And in this episode, we're going to play with our deck of many things, and I'm going to attempt to share all the information involved in such an endeavor. Uh, the deck of many things is a D&D item, and depending on the edition and the particular deck, they usually consist of 13 or 22 cards, and when it comes to its BG2 implementation, some card effects are pretty similar to what they are in pen and paper, while others are completely different. And like it says here, uh, the deck allows only a limited amount of draws before it vanishes and reappears somewhere else in the multiverse. In the game, we're going to be able to draw essentially three cards. The fourth one is always going to make the deck fade away. And before analyzing the three draws, however, there is something that needs to be explained about the whole process. The pool of possible cards we can draw from is dependent on which draw it is and influenced by what we have drawn already. That's because some of the cards are classified in-game as bad draws. There's a global variable in the game that calls them that way and is changed from 0 to 1 whenever we draw one of those bad cards. Now, this is just the name used in the variable, and it's not to say that the other neutral or good cards, however you prefer to call them, give you only beneficial outcomes. In fact, some of the neutral cards can give you arguably worse effects. They are simply not classified as bad draws in the game. As for the particular draws, you'll see all of the discussed options on the screen as we go through them, and I tried my best to present my complete findings here, information that I personally tested and researched, because there are a lot of sources out there with incorrect data, both when it comes to the pool of available cards in each draw and their particular effects. Also, if you want to squeeze out as much as possible out of the deck, in the sense of getting as many beneficial effects, it goes without saying that this is likely going to involve some saving and reloading, and when it comes to the most optimal paths to take, there are a couple, but it's generally recommended to take a bad card in the first draw in order to unlock better options in draws 2 and 3. You'll see what I mean in a second. Now, when it comes to the first draw, there are six possible cards. Nothing really spectacular in this selection when it comes to getting something beneficial, except the Jester, maybe, which gives the user 50,000 experience, or Flames, which summons some opponents that will grant a total of 94,000 experience for the party. The bad cards include the Dungeon, which casts an imprisoned spell that can be saved against and protected from in a multitude of ways. Berserkers and Rage, uh, spell immunity to abjuration, spell protections like spell turning, spell deflection, or spell trap, simply making your save versus death low enough, or drinking a potion of magic shielding to guarantee its success, all of those methods are going to work. And there's also Ruin, which makes us lose all of our gold. Out of the two, Dungeon is recommended to take, of course. There's also the Uraeli card, which confers a very detrimental effect, even though it's not classified as a bad card. We can't protect ourselves from it, or reverse its effect. A very nasty example of an awful consequence of drawing a neutral card. In the second draw, our options become more interesting, especially if we drew a bad card previously. Uh, cards with an asterisk next to their name are available only when we've drawn a bad card already, and cards with a dash or hyphen indicate the ones available only if we hadn't drawn a bad card yet. When it comes to the bad cards, Void casts a Disintegrate spell that can be blocked in all the ways imprisonment from the first draw could be avoided, plus we can also use Death Ward, Magic Resistance, and Spell Immunity to Alteration instead of Abjuration. Magician is the least detrimental of all the bad cards. Although it grants no saving throw, it can be protected against with spells, and its polymorphing effect lasts only two minutes anyway, and can be removed with by Dispel Magic. The Rogue card is slightly interesting in the sense that its charm can only be removed by killing the affected character. We can protect ourselves against it, however, with all of the different anti-charm spells and equipment. Now, onto the good stuff. There are three really good cards in this pool. Sun grants the party 300,000 experience, 50,000 per person in a full six-man party. That's not a trivial amount. If we've had a bad draw in the first round, however, we also have Key and Star available. Key gifts us a Ring of Protection plus 3, the best protection item in the game, not available anywhere else. Finally, Star raises the primary attribute of the character using the deck by 1. The attribute is determined by the character's class, and I'll have a list on the screen with all of the possible class combinations, but when it comes to our party in the playthrough, Sanashira would get Intelligence, Jahira and Anaman would receive Wisdom, Kirinai and Imoen would get Dexterity, and Saravak would have his Strength increased. Now, when it comes to this card and making a decision, it's worth to keep in mind that on the fourth level of Watcher's Keep, there's an opportunity to increase the attributes of our characters again, using the Machine of Lum the Mad. We can get another increase of one to all stats there. So it might be best to take, into, uh, to take that into consideration and plan for a character getting plus two bonus in total to their primary attribute. To give an example, in our situation, that would make some choices way more interesting. Uh, two Intelligence for Sinashira would be useless, of course, but... Um, 
going from 19 to 21 dexterity on Kirinai and Imoen would give them a bonus of 1 to both armor class and ranged tackle, which grants them you know, some useful stuff. When it comes to Jahira, going from 14 to 16 wisdom would give her two extra memorization slots on level 2. So, <laughs> uh, given how terrible the druid spells of that level are, that's also completely out of the question. But when it comes to increasing uh, Sir Anaman's wisdom from 16 to 18, that would give him one extra level 3 memorization slot and one extra level 4 which would be of course way better, but he has an abundance of those all, uh, available to him already, so it, it would also provide only limited usefulness. Um, and finally, Saravok, when going from his natural 18 with a uh, exceptional 100 uh, strength to 20, would give him plus 2 damage, which is something to consider, but I think in the way we're going to uh, distribute our gear soon, he is going to end up with the 20 strength belt anyway. Um, but, you know, there are... we would get some benefits um, from that card. I think the most viable option to go for would either be Kirinai, and when she's throwing daggers, uh, she would have a, a slightly better taco, and perhaps whenever going for a, a maximum negative 20 armor class, it would be slightly easier to achieve, although she doesn't really have problems with doing that uh, whenever we stack some gear on her anyway. Um, you know, those additional spell memorization slots on, on Anaman would be of some usefulness as well. And perhaps Saravok and a different gear uh, distribution would also be a viable option. But anyway, the third draw presents us with uh, quite a few cards, but most of them offer insignificant rewards. The only two real options are Moon and Throne. Moon grants a character 10 HP, which can be very welcome in certain situations, and it's probably the best option when you're soloing and don't exactly need more experience. For full parties, however, the Throne card is a major contender, as it offers an experience bomb of 1 million. In a full 6-man party, everyone is going to receive 166.6 thousand experience, a non-trivial amount that is most likely going to bring most characters to their next level up. And finally, the last draw is always going to be balance, resulting in the disappearance of the deck. So, when it comes to our path that we're going to take in the playthrough, it is going to be uh, pretty special, <laughs> because... Uh, what I wanted to achieve with these draws, of course, is to showcase what we can do with the draw of, uh, with the deck of many cards, or many things. We can equip it in our quick slot and draw cards from it, not necessarily uh, with Senashira, although we are going to do all of the draws with her. And uh, basically, what I wanted to achieve here with those draws is, of course, like I said, in the completionist playthrough, I wanted to showcase what the deck has to offer, but I didn't want to go for the best of the best uh, options here. So basically what we're going to do is in the first draw we're going to go for Ruin <laughs> to remove all of our gold. And I think that's going to be a nice punishment and a nice counterbalance to the next beneficial draws, uh, but also it's going to make the playthrough a little bit more interesting in the fact that we are going to have to care about item drops again and uh, picking them up and you know selling them uh, to raise some funds for our butler, Sespinar, <laughs> to uh, craft us all of the available, you know, uh, gear that he, that he can. Craft us all of the shiny ones. Uh, now, when it comes to the second draw, uh, we are going to go for key, uh, to get that Ring of Protection plus three. Uh, and this is going to fit perfectly in the completionist theme of the playthrough, uh, because we are going to be able to see, in that way, a very unique item that you cannot get anywhere else. And it's not going to be the best um, option from that selection, because, you know, it's just an item of protection plus three that doesn't really matter all that much this late in the game. It's going to essentially provide someone with a plus one uh, bonus to their saving throws compared to their uh, item of protection plus two that they're likely wearing. And um, I think going for, you know, sun or star would be more beneficial for us overall, but, you know, we're going to make a conscious decision to go for key and uh, have a cool, unique item to showcase in the playthrough. And finally, when it comes to the third draw, uh, Moon would be very, uh, very nice for Jahira, because as we've been able to see recently, she has become kind of our squishiest party member, uh, because when it comes to her health pool, it's one of the lowest, and uh, she doesn't have uh, protections that kind of stack up to our other characters. Because when it comes to our mages, Senashira and Imoen, of course they have the supreme mage protections. Uh, Kirinai and Saravok have very good health pools. And when it comes to Anaman, uh, with his personal buffs, he can get to very high HP as well. Plus his armor of faith is... Uh, 
you know, grants him more mitigation. He has the the supreme version of Armor of Faith, providing him with 25% damage mitigation. Whereas Jahira, uh, you know, with her slow druid progression, she still has an Armor of Faith that only grants her 15% mitigation. She has that low health pool, and when it comes to her Iron Skins, once the opponents cut through them or dispel them, uh, also taking into account her low caster level, uh, she can't really reapply them in combat too well, uh, given you know the long casting time of Iron Skins. So you know the, the, her personal protections are not that great either. So giving her the 10 hit points would be a very nice option. However, we are going to go for Throne because I think ultimately this is going to be a more fun option for us because we still have quite a few characters that need something nice from their level ups. Um, having in mind, uh, you know, Anaman wanting to get that Grand Mastery in Flails, and Kiranai wanted wanting to get that Grand Mastery in Long Swords, and also, uh, you know, Jahira, that level 15 Druid would be nice to, to get uh, somewhat earlier than just before the final encounter in the saga, where uh, it kind of works out that way for me uh, in, in most cases, that uh, I only get her to level 15 Druid very, very late in the game. It would be nice to, you know, be able to have some fun with her level 7 spells uh, for a little while longer. So that's our route. I'm going to quick save here. And uh, likely, you know, this is going to involve a lot of saves and reloads, like I said. So I'm probably going to have to cut some footage um, out of the recording. But let's see our, our first draw, what it's going to be, and how this, uh, this looks. The deck seems to vibrate in expectation as you remove it from your pack. The immediate area grows warmer for a moment, magical energy invisibly radiating from the metal plaques. So we can draw one of the cards. Running your fingers along the edge of the metallic plaques, you finally make a decision and remove your chosen card from the deck. Okay, we got Dungeon. The, the plaque depicts a scene filled with black runes and what appears to be a man screaming in terror inside a cage. It is clearly labeled Dungeon. And it got just absorbed by our uh, spell trap that uh, Senashira still has. But anyway, uh, like I said, I'm going to reload until we get Ruin and then I'm going to be back in a moment. So see you there. Well, we got flames here, so might as well uh, showcase the fight. Four fire elementals and a Balor here are going to attack us. I guess we can equip Saravok with his wave halberd to one-shot the fire elementals and make our job a little bit easier. Although my job of finding the wave is is not easy. Yes. Let's just give him a different target here. Boom. Die is right, Saravok. Well said. We have to get Sinisher out of there. She cannot heal because she used the deck of many things. What do you wish? Yes. Alright, the Balor finally appeared. We can heal Sinisher just to be sure. And we can breach the Balor once he gets his stone skin. Or perhaps he already starts with it. Although usually there's an animation indicating that they have that stone skin. So yeah, that's that's it. Forty six thousand experience for the Balor and uh, twelve for all of the uh, fire elementals. So yeah, again, I'm going to be back with Ruin. All right, here we go. A striking scene of a bolt of blue lightning striking and destroying a tall tower covers the plaque. From the tower, a horrified man falls to his death. The card is clearly labeled Ruin. And just like that, we lost half a million. <laughs> And we are down to a round zero. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the outcome we wanted. Let's quick save that and uh, go for another draw and see what we get. And I'm likely, of course, going to have to reload a bunch of times to get what we desire. Yeah, here's Rogue. So it got absorbed by uh, by our spell trap. And, of course, we also have chaotic commands that protect us from that charm. But, uh, yeah, again, I'm going to be back when we get our desired outcome. All right, cool. <laughs> the card depicts a great holy man in rich robes with the penitent bowing before him. In his hands, he holds aloft a great golden key. The card is labeled Key. 
And yes, now we get this ring, the Warder's Signet, a ring of protection plus three, which is apparently a legendary godly item that Ao the Overfather gave to Helm as a reward for the god's stalwart service during the Time of Troubles. And Helm then passed the gift onto his mortal followers. So yeah, just an item of protection plus three in the form of a ring, and I think it's going to be the most fitting if Anaman gets it. Uh, because he is going to be able to, you know, benefit from its properties, and also he, of course, is a uh, devout follower of Helm. So now having both the holy symbol of Helm and this warder's signet, he is truly Helm's chosen. And uh, I think I'm going to rework uh, Imoen's protection items a little bit to give her that ring of protection plus two now, and uh, we're going to be able to just hold on to the ring of fire uh, resistance for whenever we need it. But yeah, of course, uh, Imoen benefited from that as well, because she still was using an item of protection plus one. All right, so now we're going to save that outcome. And no monsters are about. Don't don't screw around with me, game. Yeah, now we can quick save. And uh, yeah, let's see what the third draw is going to be for us. Although, most likely I'm going to have to, you know, reload a couple of times. But let's see what's, what fortune gives us here. Alright, it gave us Moon. The card shows an achingly beautiful woman, half hidden by a lantern held in front of her as she moves through the darkness. The night sky behind her is bright and vividly, vividly real. The label below reads Moon. So yeah, plus 10 hit points. Senashiro would end up uh, with 127, although, of course, in our case, we would have given that to um, Juhira. She would have to draw the card from the deck to receive that reward, but anyway. Like I said, we're going to reload until we get thrown, so I'll see you in a moment. Actually, first I wanted to showcase this one, Skull. A picture of a bone-white skull immediately greets you. As if animate, the skull grins and immediately fills you with fear. The card is labeled Skull. And this just summons kind of a unique opponent. It kind of looks like a bone fiend, and uh, it's a creature that's fixated on attacking the user of the deck, and um, it's not going to rest until that person is killed, or it itself is killed. So it has 100 magic resistance and elemental resistance, and also 50 physical resistance, except crushing, to which it has only 25. And it attacks with a plus 5 enchanted weapon. Nothing really too special about it. We can just quickly protect Sinashiro with something and and finish its destruction. <laughs> and yeah, 20,000 of experience for that. But uh, yeah, now I'm going to be back whenever we get thrown. So see you in, see you in a moment. Okay, we got that already. It was actually the very next draw after that uh, death shade that we just witnessed. Uh, the card depicts a man seated upon an iron throne, his countenance commanding and regal both. For a moment, you are sure the figure nods to you solemnly. The card is labeled Throne. And boom! One million experience for everybody. Hooray! So, actually, we now have level ups for everyone. So let's go through them yes. and uh, see what we got here. So, Sanashira is going to have a proficiency point and another level 7 memorization slot. Very nice. And I think when it comes to that proficiency point, I am going to go with uh, the third point in two weapon style. I can't believe I ended up with two characters already <laughs> that have three points in it. Well, I just really dislike spending that third point here. But basically, um, I don't really want to go uh, any further with like short swords, for example. And uh, starting anything new for uh, Senashira would be also counterproductive compared to this option, because, for example, she sometimes might use a longsword in her, in her offhand. So we could go and just get proficiency into it. But that, um, you know, she... Because she is partially a Kensai, whenever she use a, uses a weapon that she is not proficient in, she only gets a minus two Thaco penalty to it. So, basically, uh, getting that third point into two weapon style is more beneficial because this is going to increase her offhand thaco by two with any type of weapon she chooses to use. So I can't believe we're doing this but I guess we are getting another <laughs> a character with three points in uh, two weapon style. But of course this is our you know like a very very late proficiency point so um, that shows you my priority for it. But anyway now I guess the only options are Dragon's Breath and Comet, so doesn't really matter for Senashira, she's not going to use either of them. Now, uh, Jahira gained another level in the fighter, still quite a ways off from that level 15 druid, but uh, here I think we're going to give her another hardiness to improve her, uh, improve her survivability. 
So we are going to be able to use it more often, more carelessly, perhaps. Uh, Anaman is going to get level 33. Nothing really uh, to decide upon here. Uh, also level 33 for Karenai. Actually, she got uh, she got two levels because we've had uh, 50 uh, points to spend here. And uh, yeah, also got um, five hit points, lore increased by six. Sweet. <laughs> and yeah, we got two high level abilities. And I think what we're going to do might give ourselves another avoid death. It's pretty useful. I, I like using it. It gives us an opportunity to use something else. Whereas when it comes to traps that are objectively better, you know, getting more spike traps and more time stop traps is, of course, the way to go if you want to maximize her her strength. But I think this is we can spare one more for avoid death. So she always has some um, uh, ready to go whenever we kind of need it in in some situations. I'm not going to go for evasion and greater evasion. They are still not worth it, even having an abundance of high level ability points. So now we are going to get, give her her third spike trap and next level up is going to be time stop trap again. And uh, yeah, that's going to be our decision when it comes to her. Now Imoen, level 22. Memorization slots, level 6, level 9. Also a slight improve to her Thako. And now I think we're going to go with improved alacrity on Imoen. This is going to benefit her nicely. We might... Uh, Finally start doing some kind of a time stop plus improved alacrity shenanigans with Imoen. Of course, like I explained in some episode before, I don't really want to use time stop yet on Sinashira because her time stops are just incredibly powerful, but perhaps on Imoen we are going to uh, we are going to do such a thing because now she has one more level 9 memorization slot and she has improved alacrity. Uh, we're going to try to look for a fight that is going to lend itself well to uh, the uh, time stop improved alacrity combo to showcase its potential. Uh, we're also going to uh, see a very potent combo like that, uh, likely, from an opponent pretty soon. Anyway, when it comes to Saravox level up, getting closer to that Halberd Grand Mastery, this is also going to be uh, pretty nice for him, allowing him to, in the end, wield uh, the upgraded Ravager. And uh, now I think we can give him one greater Whirlwind. So he's going to have one normal Whirlwind and one greater. He also has one Hardiness and that Death Blow uh, path. So I think the next choice is going to be another Hardiness, I think, for him. And uh, yeah, now we have all of our level ups done. Our deck of many things is about to expire, as we will see. Let's use it for the final time. The card shows an old man with flaming red hair and fiery eyes staring out at you. In his hands, he holds a scale, the small silver balls evenly balanced. The card is clearly labeled Balance. Almost immediately, you realize that the man is the creator of the deck. The image both smiles slightly and nods to you, tapping the scale in his withered hands. What remains of the deck of many things begins to fade suddenly, and within the space of a moment, it is gone forever. So yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> he doesn't want us to get too many benefits out of the deck, <laughs> I guess, uh, and uh, takes the toy away from us. Uh, what's interesting, actually, is that in pen and paper, the balance card actually changes the alignment of the user, uh, to its polar opposite. So Senashira would actually end up as a lawful evil character after receiving that card. But of course, in our case, this just uh, makes sure that you can't uh, you know, keep drawing cards and, and getting more benefits. Not to upset the balance, I guess. All right, and now we are ready to advance to the next level, the fourth level of Watcher's Keep. And uh, for that, we are going to have to wait to the next episode because there's a lot of adventures I want to kind of start uh, clearly from from the beginning of the next episode so that we can get familiar with that uh, level and uh, you know see what uh, it can offer to us so for now I thank you for watching I hope you enjoyed this uh, kind of a different episode dedicated to the deck of many things uh, completely and I'll see you next time